Today on The Question Is with Anthony Portentino, we're going to go deep inside a subject that doesn't seem to get the attention it deserves, autism. Frankly, we all know someone who has a child affected by autism, but do we really understand it or the child with mild and severe learning, social, and cognitive issues? I hope after today we'll have a much better grasp as my guests come from a leading children's health care agency that helps both children and parents develop as a family to their fullest potential. Let's ask the question. I'm Anthony Portentino, and my guests on The Question Is are two of the nicest and most committed people you'll ever want to get to know. Dr. Diane Cullinane is a pediatrician at the forefront of cutting-edge treatment and advocacy for children with autism. And Joseph Lee is the father of an autistic son and an attorney advocate who sits on the board of the Pasadena Child Development Associates. Their stories and passions will get you excited and tug at your heart. Welcome, and let's ask the question. Welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Absolutely. You know, doctor, could just tell me, tell me a little bit about autism. What do, what do I need to know? Well, autism is a condition which is quite prevalent now. In our agency, PCDA, we see many, many children with a diagnosis of autism. And I can tell you a little bit about how I first got into mm -hmm. working with children with autism. It was actually while I was still in college in 1975. I had a summer job working at a clinic in Texas for children with challenges. And some of the children there had autism. And people were really at a loss as to how to help them. It really wasn't until 1980, five years after that, that um, was the year I graduated from medical school that was the first time that autism became a diagnosis within the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. Not till the 80s. 1980. Prior to that, um, the term was used, but it was really combined with children with uh, childhood schizophrenia. It was a very, considered a very, very rare condition and very poorly understood. Then you move forward 10 years, 1990. Through that time, there had just been uh, the beginning of this uh, exponential increase in the incidence of autism. And in 1990, I was working with LA Unified School District when children first became eligible for special education, three to five-year-old children. I was seeing an awful lot of children that had autism. And at that time, if we talked with a parent and told them what your child is presenting with is a condition called autism, they had never heard of it before, and we still had very little to offer. That was in the 90s, and now here we are almost 15 years later. And now when parents come in to a clinic and they have a concern about their child, they are already asking, Is, does my child have autism? because it's become more prevalent. It's so much in the news. I was gonna say, there's a lot more information available on the internet. I mean, people can yes. you know, self-investigate. And they self-investigate and their friends and their teachers and strangers will say, you know, your child looks like they may have autism. And uh, so there's more awareness of the term. It's still uh, difficult for families, oh, however, absolutely. because it's not a diagnosis where you can get a blood test or an x-ray and have a definitive answer. And there's a spectrum. I mean, there's not everybody, I was reading today, not, no two autistic children are the same. There's a wide spectrum, and it's a diagnosis that's really made clinically. And it needs to be made by someone who has a lot of experience, who takes the time to get the history and to um, understand that child. And, <clears throat> and that's why it's hard for families. They may get very different opinions from different people. And Joseph, uh, obviously you're an advocate for <clears throat> the nonprofit uh, PCDA, but you're also the father of an autistic young son. And obviously at some point when 
your son was born as he started to develop, um, you started to notice some things. If, if you're comfortable, tell us about how it was that you came to suspect, and then what did you do as a, as a loving father to, uh, to care for your son? Sure. Um, and um, I, I think um, the story would start um, when my son was about a year old. Um, if you look at all the pictures of my son, it, it's, it's rather uncanny. Up to about his first birthday, in all his pictures, he's smiling. And then right around his first birthday, in all of his pictures, he stopped smiling. Hmm. Now, we thought it was just he was a moody kid. We thought, you know, maybe, <coughs> um, you know, we're bringing him to the photographers at the wrong time. Um, you know, we, we came up with all sorts of um, kind of uh, rationales why he stopped smiling. The second clue we had was even at age two, uh, my son Danny wasn't speaking. Um, and, you know, many people told us it's because boys speak later than girls do. You know, they all eventually uh, catch up. Um, so what we did was we went to our pediatrician at that time. And, you know, physically he checked out. He had no, um, he had no physical conditions. He was rather healthy. Uh, but she said, you know, you should really um, have him checked out if he's not speaking already. And she gave us um, the phone number to a state agency. We called them. They had us come in, and a uh, psychologist came and um, did a one-day um, in-depth uh, clinical trial with him. And at the end of that day, um, she said, there's no doubt in my mind, your son has autism. Of course, for me, I didn't want to hear that. Right. Um, like most parents, um, I thought to myself, no, autism is when the kids are in the corner, you know, kind of uh, just banging their heads against the wall, and that wasn't my son. My son, maybe he didn't speak, and maybe he did. Uh, flap his hands a little bit and maybe he um, did spin in circles a little bit and maybe he lined up his toys a little bit but you know other than that he seemed fine and normal and so for my wife and I it was a process where we had to first come to terms with the fact that our son has autism and second that a lot of the things that we expected for our life were was no longer going to be true and so for us it became a process of now saying well this is life we're still happy to have our son we still love him, so Absolutely. what are we going to do about this? And that's where our journey began in uh, walking this uh, path of living with autism and embracing it even, and getting him all the help that we can get for him. Right, and he's seven? He's nine now. He's nine now. Yes. Nine now, and so that was one and two. And mm -hmm. so he's been thriving, and you found PCDA. Um, how many years ago did you find PCDA? Well, we've, we've always known about PCDA in the community. I, I, used, I used to live down the street from PCDA. Um, PCDA is based on a, um, a philosophy called DIR floor time, which I, I know Dr. Colonnade will talk about in a, in a little bit. Right. Um, we embraced DIR floor time almost immediately as we were looking for treatment because DIR floor time was based on uh, addressing the whole child uh, and it just really fit our parenting philosophy a lot better than the alternatives. So we decided to go with that um, pretty much when Danny was first diagnosed with autism, which was um, short of his third birthday. So he was about almost, he was almost three years old at the time. Right. So. And do you want to, since we've brought that subject up, I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways, or I shouldn't say lots, there are several different approaches um, to treating the patient, the child, mm -hmm. and then also involving the family. Mm -hmm. And at PCDA, you do one of those treatments very well and, and are right. thriving at it. So right. if you could sort of walk us through that part of the... the, the sure, and, and I think I would just back up just a little bit to say that Joseph's experience is, um, is not unusual. In some ways, um, it is unusual in that he was able to identify something and get help early. Um, we know that children with autism can have differences very early on. Definitely by a year of age, the diagnosis can be made with some certainty by two years of age. But oftentimes, families don't get a diagnosis till the child's four or five. And it's important um, that if families do have a concern, that they know where to go. Right. And generally, the regular visits with their pediatrician. Uh, are important. Pediatricians are supposed to be screening for autism at 18 months and 24 months, but oftentimes the parents have to be proactive because in a typical pediatrician visit, 
you might expect your child to be crying, to be upset, to be in and out the door. They're getting shots. Getting shots. They're not necessarily um, at the best place uh, for a pediatrician to notice um, unless the parents take an active role in expressing their concerns. So the concerns that we're talking about are, as in Joseph's sons, delayed language. That's always a key piece mm -hmm. of it, or and it may be verbal and nonverbal communication. In other words, a child that may not be pointing to things, may not be showing things, may not be waving by. Um, oftentimes people think about eye contact. They're not looking at you. Um, and, uh, and there's another component, which is how they play with objects in their world. As he was saying, maybe lining up their toys or kind of an obsession with a certain toy that they play with very, very repetitively and intensively. So these are the kind of red flags that we look for. And as you said, every child is different. And there's different degrees and there's different types of um, interests. There's also OCD and ADD that somehow get confused, right? Do the three get confused with each other or misdiagnosed sometimes or? Well, um, those conditions, OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit disorder, are usually things that people start thinking about at an older age. Mm -hmm. What um, is often uh, kind of blended at the earlier ages is a pure language delay. Right. And um, that may be what people notice first, and they may go to a speech therapist first. Um, sometimes people are um, thinking in very concrete terms about these behaviors. So they say, well, if my child looks at me, then he can't have autism. But it's a matter of degree and relativity. Right. And uh, so if there's a concern, it's important for parents to seek out the professionals. And as you know, we're very lucky in California that we have the Lanterman Act. Right. The Lanterman Act is an entitlement program which is unique to California right. and uh, has set up a system of what are called regional centers. So there are 21 regional centers across the state that are resources for families. If they have a concern about their child may have autism at any age, whether it's infancy or all the way through adulthood, they can go to the regional center and have an assessment at no charge, and that can be a very good starting place to finding out about what is happening for your child and what kind of resources might be available. Right, and then from that diagnosis, then you can see what's available in your community, or you can go back to the regional center as well. The regional center is um, the place that can inform you about what's available in the community and oftentimes they're the ones who fund the services right. as well. So at PCDA we are one of the agencies which is called a vendor of the regional center. So when a family goes to the regional center if they have that diagnosis they could be referred to come to us for intervention. Right. And now we get into what the kind of invention is that we do. Before we get into the into yeah. that, um, so parent walks in your door, then you do your own diagnosis, right? You you don't just accept what the regional center does, or do you do your own evaluation, or how does that yeah how does that work? Um, it really depends. There's different ways that it could happen. Parents might choose to come to us first for a diagnosis, um, and we have staff that are qualified to do that kind of assessment and diagnosis or they might come after they already have the diagnosis and our assessment will be um, not specifically to get a diagnosis but to do an assessment of what are their needs and what are their goals developmentally that we want to work on. All right. When we come back on the question is um, we're going to go much deeper into the actual intervention, the treatment and some of the steps that are taken at PCDA and also to help families uh, struggling with children with autism. So please come on back. Who needs this modern world? I can live just fine out here without the road rage and boy bands. Of course, I might miss my Charter HD with football on ESPN and Walking Dead on AMC. ESPN and AMC. And, well, Shark Week on Discovery HD. But that's all. AMC, ESPN, Discovery, TBS, and Comedy Central HD. But that's it except for HBO HD. Charter now has over 100 HD channels and more brilliant HD shows on demand than ever. We're back on the question is with Anthony Portantino. 
getting deeper and deeper into autism. And thank you, uh, doctor, again, and Joseph for sharing your uh, personal perspective and stories. Um, so with interventions, um, child gets diagnosed. Um, there's basically two schools of thought of what, to, what happens next. If you could walk us through sort of the two approaches and why you prefer one over the mm -hmm. other, and, and, and both are, are valid, but why you do what you do. Right, in, in uh, behavioral health treatments, there's two general approaches. The better known is called ABA, or Applied Behavioral Analysis. And uh, the other uh, approach is a developmental relationship-based approach. There are several within that category. The one that we use is called DIR floor time. So uh, what that is, the D stands for development or emotional development. I is individual, R is relationship, and then floor time. Right. And the uh, two different approaches are very different. Uh, and they are different in their goals. They're different in the way that the uh, intervention is done. and. Um, and their whole uh, background and history of researchers and people that have contributed to these two models are quite different. Um, I can speak uh, to the DIR floor time model. It comes from a very humanistic, uh, comprehensive way of looking at a child, uh, child's development. We look at uh, our goals as being things such as a sense of warmth and intimacy and relationship a sense of creativity, of initiative, of imagination. And it's an approach where when we have those goals, the interventions that we use are very much tied to following the child's interests, always in relationship, always in interaction with other people. And the outcomes then are wonderful. Our outcomes are children who are engaged, who are interested in other people and interested in the world. Can you give me an example of a specific exercise or some something mm -hmm. specific? Mm -hmm. Well, a very simple one might be, for example, a child who likes to line up trains. And they're fascinated by lining up the trains. They might get down low on the table and just look at the line that they've created and um, be very precise about it and actually um, be disturbed if somebody comes and tries to play and tell them to do something different. So what we would do is try and understand what's so interesting about that and how to join in with a child's interest. So we might help them to line them up. We might get down at the other end of the line and look back and forth with them. So you're not saying don't line up the trains. You're saying, boy, that's cool you know, we'll help you line up the trains. Right. So you're and not passing judgment on the behavior, right? in a sense. And it's our starting place. That's how we link in with this child and build their sense of trust with us. And then we can go from there to building more complex interactions. Right. And Joseph, um, with your own, with Danny, um, you found this to be effective. Um, could you touch upon some of the things that uh, he liked to do and some of the things that uh, Dr. Cullinane and her associates have helped uh, specifically with him. Sure, Anthony, and uh, let me say, um, let me begin by saying that um, with the two, um, the two different interventions, with um, one like ABA, you'll see results immediately. With DIR, it takes a little longer to blossom, but at least in, uh, with Danny, um, when he blossomed, he, he really blossomed, and there was a real big difference. I saw difference. that in your eye. I could see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I'm just a proud dad when I even think yeah. about it. And so let me just give you uh, an example in speech therapy because, um, uh, as I mentioned before, Danny had um, a, a very big uh, speech delay. Um, and so we started getting speech therapy in the school system just about immediately. And the school system uses an ABA approach for just about all that they do uh, because that's what most of their interventionists are trained in. And that works great for a lot of kids. Uh, but with Danny, uh, with speech therapy, uh, it didn't work that well. And the reason it didn't work that well was because um, it was based on a set of rules where when something happened, B was supposed to happen. When A happened, you know, you were supposed to do this. And with my son, his temperament uh, just didn't really 
bode well for that kind of treatment. So uh, we switched our speech therapy over to PCDA, and that was based on a DIR model where, for instance, my son does love trains. He also loves balloons. So the speech therapist would actually start playing with trains and balloons uh, while, um, while doing speech therapy, and it led to more speech. And the way they did that was um, they would take out the balloons and they would say, some, for instance, Danny, if you want to blow up the balloon, you have to tell me how to blow it up. And they would, they, you know, so it they would engage his, it would engage his interest. Exactly. That he wanted to be verbal right. about. Right. And wanted to express himself and had a way to bring that out right. in him. And uh, what we found was that not only did he do this in the context of speech therapy, he would come home, he'd bring me balloons, and he'd start saying, <laughs> blow the balloon. And he would bring the, you know, the little blower and all of that. Right. From there... Uh, what we saw was his speech, I mean, it was very slow when it first started. Um, even with the treatment, I think it was a full year and a half before he even said word one. But now he's actually pretty verbal, where at least if he wants something bad enough, he's going to say it verbally. And if he really is motivated enough, he will speak it even in almost complete sentences. And that's a huge uh, jump in ability for him. Right. So that that's just a small example of how it's really helped us. Now, in your other hat, you're an advocate as well. I mean, you you have taken on some legal. You're an attorney, mm -hmm. and so you've taken on some legal uh, work on behalf of both PCDA and and other parents. Uh, could you walk me? I mean, if someone wanted to be an autism advocate, um, what can they do, and who should they talk to, and tell us about what you've done. Mm -hmm in that role? Generally, there's two areas where uh, I work with families that have kids with uh, uh, developmental disabilities or any disabilities, really. The first, um, the first uh, way that I help is what we're talking about. I work with the school districts and the regional centers uh, to ensure that the children are getting the supports and the services that they need. So, um, and deserve under the law. Right, exactly. So there are times when the parents and the school district or the regional center may disagree to the severity of the child's problem, the eligibility of the child, uh, the treatments that are appropriate. And so what we do is we try to work collaboratively at first. And if that doesn't work, well, we try other means that attorneys <laughs> have. Right. And um, well, we, we just make sure that the, the, the child is taken care of. And then the second way that we help also is we do estate planning. Now, estate planning generally for a young family is not even on the radar. But if you have a child with uh, special needs, um, it could become catastrophic if that right. something happens to mom and dad and the special needs estate plan is not put in place. So we do that as well to help. Yeah, a good friend of mine has two sons in their 40s who have special needs. And I can tell, you know, the dad works so hard all the time mm -hmm. and he's always planning for the day when he's not going to be here to look after his two sons. Right. And, I, you know, I... Uh, he's always in a good mood, but I always know that that's a concern mm -hmm. on his brow that he's wondering, you know, how are my children going to be when, right. when I'm not here? And so, you know, yeah. people do need mm -hmm. to start early and plan that's right. uh, on those aspects. Um, Dr. Cullinane, uh, Joseph talked a little bit about the, the privileges and the rights and the, mm -hmm. the responsibilities both of the school district, of the state, um, and you have to deal with that bureaucracy every day and there are some good parts to it and there are some frustrating parts of it what's what's the state of california doing well and what's it not doing so well right well joseph and i also uh, are part of the dir floor time coalition of california right. and that is a group of uh, parents and professionals who feel it's very important for parents to know about the options for care for their children that are available across the state and we do have a big problem in the state of California in that w there are a lot of inequities in what different children and different families are able to access. And it starts with families just being aware of what's available. Right. And, um, and so I think part of it is knowing your rights, part of it is knowing what are the different intervention approaches that are out there and then being able to use your rights to access those. And how does it work? You're, you know, you're a public school kid, you get your IEP, mm -hmm. you know, what happens at that point? Um, well, the IEP is the process that happens within the school district and their focus, of course, is on academic achievement and giving the supports that a child might need for academic achievement. The regional center 
uh, has a similar process called an IPP, Individual Program Plan, and that is to look at somebody's goals outside of the academic area, particularly for children with autism, it's social skills right. and behavioral um, supports. And since autism is primarily a diagnosis of social and communication disorder, there's a big role for the regional centers to play in helping families to know about what are the different types of uh, treatments that are available and how the families can access those. Now there was just a change in law in relation to the funding model mm -hmm. and how how the money goes mm -hmm. from the state to the patient and mm -hmm. you supported that change in that model. Could you walk us through about how things used to be and what the big change is under state law now and how that's going to you think, I believe, positively I think affect the, the child? Uh, there's a bill that was passed this year, right. and we call it the Self-Determination Bill. It has another official name, which I don't remember. Maybe you remember, Joseph. <laughs> but I we call it the Self-Determination Bill. And what that is, is an option for families, for families that are getting services through the regional center. They can now request that they basically become their own service coordinator so that they are allocated a certain amount of funds and they can make the choices themselves about how to use those funds and which services they want to access. It will, it's really a wonderful opportunity for families who feel that they are being, um, in some ways, have some barriers to being able to access the services that they think would be best for their children. Right, so it really empowers the family to make a good decision in the best interest of their children. Imagine that, empowering the families to be in charge <laughs> of the families. Yeah, it's, families are always the ones, as you know, to push the system forward. Right. And uh, we want to support them in doing that. Well, I will uh, share, I, when I did a tour of your facility one day, there was a mom and a, and a young son who was playing hide and seek and peekaboo <laughs> with me on, on an iPad. Yeah. He could not verbalize, but he knew which buttons depress and we had a wonderful yeah. uh, game of hide and seek yeah. on an iPad and he was beaming and his mother was yeah. standing there beaming so it's yeah. it's it's amazing what All you right. can see we called AAC augmentative and alternative communication for children who for one reason or another are unable to verbalize but they can communicate and they sometimes have amazing insight and awareness of the world that you would never know unless right. they had access to a means of communication. Right. Um, as we're, we're running out of time a little bit, what sort of last thing do you want to impart on, on a family that's going down this journey? Well, I'm going to ask Joseph the same question too, so Diane, sure. you go first. You know, I see it um, kind of where we started, that the change that has come from 1980s, 1990s to where we are now, mm -hmm. there's so much more available. And that's what I'd want families to know. Joseph, real quick. I would say you're your child's best advocate, so make sure that you do all that you can to advocate for your child, because nobody knows your child better than you do. That's a very good uh, way to end this uh, very wonderful discussion on autism. Um, Obviously, early detection, being aware of your child is important, uh, going to the regional center, getting the right diagnosis, and then choose the path of treatment that you feel benefits your child. And as Joseph talked about, you know, he saw both and the different results of each and how it all worked out uh, for Danny's benefit. So thank you for being on. The question is uh, to talk about autism, and we'll see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.